Hello everyone, welcome, my name is Steve. I'm gonna be doing a product review today on something that I should have bought years ago because admittedly, I've been doing something wrong for that amount of time. I've been using another tool instead of a proper thread chaser kit. And that is precisely what we're gonna be learning about and testing today. This is Vever's fully loaded thread chaser kit featuring the UNF and UNC chasers. That's your imperial sized fine and coarse threaded chasers. But most importantly, for those of us working on a lot of European cars, the biggest selection of metric chasers from any other kit that I've seen online. To round out the kit, you also get two thread pitch gauges and three thread files, both of which come in standard and metric, and I'll use both in a little demo later. While you're watching this review and you figure, yep, I need to add this to my tool collection, please do use the links in the description of this video that go out to Beaver's website. Those links help me a little bit too. And quick story time, because although this kit is brand new, before I even made it to this video, I already had to put it to the test and it did save the day. So. Just coincidentally, got this kit on a Friday, woke up Saturday morning, saw my neighbor across the street swapping on his summer wheels and tires. Now, unfortunately, Matt got a little bit wild and he just annihilated the threads on one of his wheel studs. So I grabbed my kit, ran over with the correct thread file, and I was able to shave off some of the material that had been mashed down into the lower part of the threads away so that we could successfully thread on a nut to at least clamp down the wheel and get them to a shop to replace that stud. Sorry for calling you out, Matt. The story was perfect. You're on YouTube now. I'm gonna recreate that scenario later by mangling the hell out of this bolt and making sure that this nut can still thread down on it. Now, before I accidentally turn this video into a slap chop infomercial, I need to humbly share the mistake that I've been making in the past, which is using taps and dies to clean threads. This is my tap and die set, and on the surface level, of course, these tools look pretty similar, right? Well, they exist for different reasons, as you've guessed. Let's go ahead and take one tap and one die and compare it to its equivalent chaser and look at how they're designed differently to answer the question of why you think you could use one of these to do cleaning, but you really shouldn't. In the most basic of terms, the taps and dies are used to create new threads where they don't exist before, and thread chasers are used to clean existing threads. And because of these markedly different purposes, we are going to see some dramatic differences in the design of each tool. Let's talk about the fluting first. That's probably the biggest visual difference between the two. On the tap, it is much larger. You can see compared to that little line on the chaser, that's because we have a ton of material that we need to evacuate during the cutting process. The reason there's so little circumference dedicated to the fluting compared to the working surface is because just that, it needs to spend all of its circumference working down in the root or the minor diameter of the thread to actually do the cleaning. Keep in mind with a thread chaser, you're not just there to clean and remove gunk in a hole, you might actually have some damage in there. A great example would be if something is cross-threaded and the high point of the thread is actually folded down into where the lower point would be. That's the root that I was talking about. In this case, we need to work on that spot over and over again to get that material out of the way where it's not supposed to be. But I'm sure plenty of you are still thinking like I used to, which is who cares? I can still use a tap and run it through a hole. And as long as it's following the threads that are already there, it'll pull out the junk in there. It'll clean up some high or low spots. Why would I actually use a chaser? The important differences come down to taps are really sharp and they're not actually the same size. Exhibit A, let's go back to this example. These are side by side M8 by 1.25 thread pitch. And look at the working edge of both the chaser and the tap. The tap is so pointy and sharp compared to the chaser, it looks outright dull. And here's what I'm talking about for size. So what I have in my hand is an M8 bolt and I can use my fastener guide here. And uh, there it goes, fits perfectly through. There's no more room, there's no less room. It is definitely an M8. Now I will take my M8 chaser, do the exact same thing from the back. Works exactly the same way. I'll take my M8 tap. Now all of a sudden, can't get it through, it's just a little bit too big. Now understanding those two big differences, I think you're probably starting to see the problem here, which is a tap wants to cut threads. So if it is not perfectly in line with the existing threads, it can go off on its own new path and start cutting threads and mashing the old ones behind it, which is of course terrible, but also because it's just nominally a little bit wider, it's also cutting deeper into the overall circumference of the existing fastener hole, removing material that you actually need to be there. Now here's where I'm gonna inject a little bit of personal opinion. I think that some Sometimes it doesn't matter if you use a tap versus a chaser, but other times, many other times, it matters a lot if you use a chaser instead of a tap. Here's where subjectively the difference lies for me. So the whole point of cleaning a thread is to get the stuff that's out of there and leave the threads structurally intact because at some point you're going to fasten two things together with a torque load. And of course, from your personal experience, you know that torquing something effectively is just making the threads of the fastener slide against the receiving threads in a hole probably until you get that desired torque load on your torque wrench. 
and clean full bodied threads. Make sure that the torque load that your torque wrench is seeing is actually accurate and that the threads on the receiving end are actually strong enough to hold that tension. So the worst case scenario that you can create with everything you've learned so far in the video is that if you use a tap to clean out a hole poorly and there's still stuff left in there, greasing up the threads probably, then it's actually a little bit larger, right? So it's removed some material that it wasn't supposed to and this is a high torque yielding fastener like a head stud. That is the recipe for disaster and how you see those videos online of someone turning a head stud into a righty loosey situation where it snaps off inside of their torque wrench or it turns the threads inside of the block into mashed potatoes. Either way, total nightmare that was caused by a massive over torquing situation by weakened threads that were greased up and yielding way over the specified torque value inside of the hole. But of course that was an extreme example. I think in the other cases where something is smaller, so these are M8s, but let's drop it down to like M456 or something like that. And maybe it's just a bracket that's being held onto the firewall or something like that. And we're not talking about race cars here, people. So it's not too bad. I think in those cases, you probably could get away with using a tap just to freshen up some threads and hold something together that sees very small torque values. But even then, you still might be forced to use a chaser because of the functionality that it gives you when you're trying to clean out a hole that has a bottom on it. So in other words, you can't pass it in through one side and have the tip go out the other side. It actually bottoms out somewhere. Let's take a look at the shape of these again. The crux of the problem for the tap is that it is by design tapered right at the end. So it doesn't actually reach its full width where it can actually start cutting full size grooves until about maybe a third of the way down. Whereas the chaser, you can see plain as day, full working circumference all the way to the tip of the tool. So let's go ahead and put this M10 by one and a half thread chaser to the test. In this exact same situation, on the top of the transmission, we have a few holes here that you use to mount your shifter linkages and they do have bottoms in them. Now what I've done is I've got a hole over here that was actually unused, but in my hand is a fastener that's also M10 by one and a half. And right now it can thread into these holes that were used before, like so, right? Good. But on this hole that was not used, it simply can't. I can maybe get a little piece of the thread started, but I can't shove it in there by hand. So let's go ahead and clean it out and see if we can run this fastener through later by hand smoothly. First up, I'm gonna put a little bit of cutting fluid in here. Not that we're doing cutting, it's just I want some lubricant in there so that it's not just the dry chaser on dry hole. And once we start getting a little bit of the gunk out of the threads, I actually want it to stick a little bit to the chaser so I can help pull it out easier. Okay, so it's in maybe a half turn, and the great part is I can use my socket for this. That's great. I'm just gonna back it up a little bit, and then keep going. Every time I get into a little bit of resistance. I go for a few turns, back it up, let some of that junk fall into the flutes and then keep moving forward. All right, so we're either at the bottom or at the very least I've run out of chaser length. Let's get this out of here. And just to give you a look at what came out of there, you can see there's definitely some chunky stuff up on the shank and inside of the threads, it's a little bit dirty too. So it wasn't too bad, right? That was just an unused hole that was open to the environment and stuff was falling in there over time. Let's see if it was clean enough to thread in that new bolt. Here's the bolt from earlier, still perfectly clean. I have not threaded it in here, no movie magic. This is truly my first attempt since cleaning it. And uh, let's see. Yeah, that's where it got stuck before. Yeah, it's still not perfectly smooth, but I mean, obviously I can do this by hand, so 
Mission accomplished. So it's not that surprising that it can clean pretty easily, but let's see if we can repair some seriously damaged threads. I'm gonna use this old stretch bolt here to recreate that example of my neighbors, and we're gonna get set up using the kit, first with the measurement. Now, I know this doesn't come with the kit, but I would say is a very necessary piece of measurement tooling to have in the garage. There is a link in the description of this video to go out to Amazon to get one for yourself. So once again, let's figure out what metric size this bolt is in the first place. And it is a 12. Then we'll grab our metric thread gauge here. And uh, yes, I've already figured out which one this is. This is a one and a half, but if you've never used something like this before, just flip through your options and you're simply matching up the pattern. You take one of your options out, match the teeth up with what you see on the threads. And if they fit perfectly, that is what it is. So this is a one and a half by M12. And now that I know what size this is, I'll know what corresponding file to use later. But first let's ruin this thing. Sayonara to about the five first row of threads. And now we must arm ourselves with the appropriate file. There's one for metric, UNC, UNF, and you'll notice a bunch of numbers on the sides. That is according to your thread pitch that you need to use. So this side right here, 1.50, this is the face that I'll need to be using, but it also has 1.25, 2.5, 3, 1, 0.75, and 2, and 1.75. Also, the handle is just that. That can be removed. <laughs> That's where the other threads are. You just switch this to the other side. Now, there's really not too much to it. It's just make note of the fact that the threads, they aren't perfectly straight, right? They're always tilted a little bit. So you wanna push your thread to make sure that you're actually on the thread path. And you can start by using a good portion of the threads first, right? So I'll start at the bottom here, find my groove, and just work over my damaged spots. I can already see a little bit of material falling off and those first couple of threads are sharpening up. And the fact of the matter is that you can't create material where it once was. The threads are not going to be perfect. Your goal is just to be able to thread your fastener back in or a nut back on. After a few minutes, I've got a nice little pile of material that I've shaved off. And here's a top view for you. So you can see that the folded down parts of the threads that used to be down in the root portion are at least now out of the way. And now you're looking parallel to the damage. So it's up on the top and you can see the side profile isn't exactly sharp, but there are peaks like the thread should be. Now, even though it looks repaired before I send it and try to run this nut on here, that would actually risk cross threading again. So I will take my other chaser. This is just a different style, kind of like a die would be also M12 by one and a half. And I'm just gonna see if I have enough threads here to start the nut on. And it'll either help me determine that I need to do more filing, or it'll help clean out some of the lower portion of the threads too. So I can tell by my early attempt here that the threads are not defined enough yet. So I need to go back to filing. I continue to work the end over for a little while. And now I can get my chaser over here. I will note that I think the tolerances are a little sloppy on these. There are a few moments where I'm threading this on and it's actually kind of tilting the opposite direction of the threads. And of course the risk there is that uh, you actually cross thread your fastener with your chaser, which would be no good. But I am able to successfully thread this on now. So I think we're ready for the big test. Keep in mind the damage portion is actually away from you. It's at the, the back at this moment, but no matter, the real test is yes or no. And clearly the repair worked. And here's just a final look at the repaired thread. It's not perfect, that's my point. This is something you're gonna do in a pinch to get yourself out of a jam on a Sunday when the auto parts stores are closed, or maybe it's an old vehicle and these parts are no longer available and you just have to make do. So yes, the two examples I just did are fairly basic, albeit realistic, I would say, for cleaning and thread repair, but I admit it can get way worse than that. The bolt that I sort of damaged there was not a fully stripped bolt. And I wanna bring that up because that's not what this kit is all about. This kit's really about prevention through good thread cleaning and basic thread repair. But if that bolt was fully, fully stripped out, 
This kit is not going to save that scenario. You're going to have to replace hardware like that. Last stop here on the review, I wanna talk about the manufacturing quality because one, I've made some observations working with the tools already, and two, I wanna do a hardness test. One inconsistency of manufacturing that seems to be prevalent across a lot of these chasers is that, for example, on this one right here, this is actually an M8 by 1.25, but it seems like the only number that made it onto the samping was the five, whereas everything else around it actually has all the digits. Then over on the other styles of chasers, it seems to be inconsistent both in terms of the style, sometimes they're really small and sometimes they're quite large. And then the location, sometimes they're seemingly on what I would call the front and sometimes they're on the back. And if I'm being a little picky, it's actually kind of hard to take out these thread pitch gauges and put them back in. The little slots that are made for them are just like not very well sized. You might consider those things to be superficial and I agree, they're not gonna stop you from getting the job done. But what might is the actual quality of the metal itself. If these things are too soft, they might actually cross thread themselves in the process of cleaning or repair and we can't have that. So let's do an HRC hardness test. HRC is the abbreviation for the Rockwell hardness test. There are other metric systems to test the hardness of metal. And as you'd imagine in specific measurements like this, there are instrumentations that are extremely expensive, hundreds if not thousands, tens of thousands of dollars to do that measuring. I'm not doing that. I'm gonna take the simple way that won't give me as accurate a measurement, but a nice little ballpark. Vever advertises that these tools are somewhere between 55 and 62, which is pretty tough. So let's see where it lands. The principle is pretty simple here. We have a set of files that are ascending in terms of, let's say, toughness. And basically I would expect the hardest one to scratch basically everything because I don't think any of these are gonna be harder than 65. That is sort of the range that we're looking at here and we're gonna move down the list and when eventually we see it stop scratching, we know that it's in a certain range. This process is pretty easy, so I'm gonna start with the 65 and I very much imagine this will scratch it. Yes, very easy. So it's certainly something below 65. Here comes the 60. Yep, very, very easy. So below 60, we give ourselves a fresh side to scratch up here. 55. So that one's interesting. Keep in mind these are anodized, so it's okay that we are digging through that top layer. I don't expect that to be hard, but it's really about the steel itself. Here comes the 50. I do see some very shiny metal down there. I think it actually might be eating into the metal. 45. Yeah, I'm seeing quite a bit of raw, very shiny metal streaks in there. 40. Okay, so, oh, spoke too soon. That's interesting. I'm gonna switch to a different tool and see if we can get a little bit of a closer look at the actual metal surface. Let's try this again on the head of this uh, longer chaser. I'm gonna start with the softest file this time. Yeah. It's most certainly grabbing. And you can see in the teeth of my file here, that's real metal stuck in between. A pretty telling outcome, wasn't it? I would say there is 0% chance any of these are above 60. I would say it's extremely unlikely any of these are even in the 50s and potentially they're even actually below 40. So perhaps what I can leave you with on this topic is, does it matter? Does it matter to you based on what you're working on? Are you working inside of an aluminum head? Or what about the bottom end of an engine block that's cast iron? Do you think that the metallurgy of these tools are going to affect your ability to clean and do some basic repairs? You might have to decide. So overall, time to make a decision. What's it gonna be for you? I'd say that the value is pretty decent. Like I said off the top of the video, the sheer selection is hard to beat. I originally was actually looking for a metric only set, and even in those sets, I still couldn't find as many metric options as what's in here. And do they work? Well, yes, we proved that they do perhaps because of the results that we saw in the metal hardness test that you might wanna be a little careful, make sure there's some lubrication, maybe only go so far, clean out that fastener hole once in a while. Don't put yourself in precarious situations with these tools, but they should serve you well. 
I think if ever wanted to kick up the value just a little bit more to be an all-encompassing kit, it probably should include one of these too. If you have any questions about this kit, please let me know in the comments. I'm always happy to run out to the garage, take a little look at something and answer you. It's no big deal. Easier for me to check it than for you to buy something that you don't want. But hopefully you do want this kit. And a reminder, please do use the links in the description of this video. And that's going to help me do more product reviews in the future. As always, thank you so much for watching. I really hope you found this review helpful. Maybe throw me a like, maybe a subscribe, and hopefully I will see you next time. Thanks.